All right, perfect. Well, hello. Uh, my name is Alan West. I'm here today to talk to you guys about proxy jacking for profit. Uh, proxy jacking uh, for profit is sort of this class of attacks that I was fortunate enough to discover one of the first uh, public campa campaigns. Uh, there's only been a couple discovered to date, so I'm going to be talking about the one I discovered and sort of the implications it has on sort of the ecosystem of the internet. All right, so like I said, my name is Alan West. Um, I'm a security researcher at Akamai on their security intelligence response team, uh, better known as Akamai CERT. Um, and basically, we're tasked with doing a whole bunch of different kinds of threat research and uh, supporting the business with intelligence. Uh, what that sort of means, I'll go into on the next slide, but um, because Akamai is so widely used around the internet, um, it sort of means looking after the ecosystem of the internet as well, which is why today's talk was something of interest to me and my team. I'm also a Marine Corps veteran, um, and some of my just general interests are doing basically anything that gets me outside of my office and uh, exercise and uh, playing with my dog, flying drones, things like that. So like I said, my team is Akamai CERT, and um, uh, as researchers, we're sort of interested in any sort of emerging threats. Uh, we spend a lot of time sort of trying to correlate intelligence from many different sources um, and finding interesting things about that, publishing research, but also making it uh, actionable within the organization and other teams in other organizations. Uh, so basically, we do a whole bunch of different kinds of things. Um, some of the things we're particularly interested in are DDoS attacks and techniques. Um, various exploits to networking protocols, um, various threat campaigns like I discussed before. And then um, we, are, we go into a lot of different malware analysis and uh, that's typically involving botnets. And my team likes focusing on IoT and uh, Go is something that we're weirdly interested in as well. Uh, and so part of our job is also to educate both within the organization and outside about some of these things. And um, one of the main projects that we have internally, just to give you a little bit of background, is called Hydra. It's basically a globally distributed um, massive honeypot network um, and that has various different custom honeypots that we make on a daily basis. Everything from very low interaction to uh, very high interaction ones. So um, most of the stuff that you see today will be pulled straight from Hydra and some of the work we've done around that sort of deal. All right, so just setting the scene, um, this talk was basically uh, made after discovering a proxy jacking attempt in one of our SSH honeypots within Hydra. And um, we quickly, after analyzing some of the scripts used, as you can see in the top screenshot there, it's actually three screenshots on top of each other, um, we discovered the motive to be monetary primarily. Um, and so, that caught my interest and I wanted to look at it closer and see how they could be doing that. Um, this is actually one of only three campaigns that I know of. Um, if you look it up on like Hacker News, it's us and then two other articles by Sysdig. Uh, so you can see those two, um, the two of those articles also in these screenshots. All right, so uh, before digging into the actual attack that I'm gonna talk about today, I wanted to do a little bit of background about some of the components that play into this sort of campaign. And obviously, one of the main things is gonna be proxies. Uh, so there's a bunch of legitimate uses for proxies, as most of you probably know. Um, uh, essentially, what a proxy is, is it's just like an intermediary uh, for a request that gets, you know, your, your request gets sent and then it goes somewhere else. So some sort of, action gets done in the middle and then it gets forwarded on to um, either the origin or another proxy or something like that. Uh, these kinds of proxies are by no means exhaustive and they sort of overlap a lot of times as well, but these are some just examples for if you're not as familiar with proxies uh, that we can sort of enter this conversation. So some transparent proxies um, are primarily used for like content restriction or caching. Um, and then you also have reverse proxies where um, sort of traffic comes in, hits that proxy, then goes to the intended server. And that's more for like load balancing, also caches, and um, different security and logging purposes. Uh, then you also have anonymity, so an anonymous proxies uh, that sort of give you a little bit more privacy and maybe bypass restrictions. That's how a lot of the um, like sort of the commercial uh, VPNs or proxies are, get advertised. It's like, oh, you can see Netflix in a different country. 
something like that. So that might be how most people are familiar with these. Uh, and then they also have distorting. So basically you can provide fake information. So it goes further to just like, not just anonymize you, but actively sabotage whoever's trying to monitor you. Uh, and then you also have residential, uh, which is one that's of interest for this talk, is basically um, some sort of um, endpoint that's on a residential network that um, your traffic could get um, sort of routed through. And we'll, we'll talk about the different uses of that. But there's many, many more. Uh, and then there's also many different uh, malicious uses of proxies over the years. And as you can see, a lot of them are very similar to the legitimate uses. Um, so it sometimes toes a fine line. But uh, you know, any powerful security tool uh, can be used for both good and harm, depending on what you're using it for. Uh, so we also have things like anonymity, uh, bypassing restrictions, again, uh, DDoS, if you're routing through a bunch of different proxies, it's harder to nail down uh, where the original source is and sort of stop that. Um, and then you also have things like credential stuffing and brute forcing. So in this, uh, this picture that you see, this is not our research, but there's a, um, there was this article about this massive 400,000 proxy strong botnet, and uh, they were basically residential proxies that they were used for credential stuffing campaigns. Uh, so, as you can see, that's like one real-world application, just one off the top of my head. Uh, but there's also things like web scraping, uh, spam distribution is a big one, um, both, you know, botnets in general as well as uh, where they're trying to use like relays to pass it on so you can't nail them down, similar to DDoS. Uh, then they also use spready malware, which I'll show you one example of that a little bit later in this talk. And then just overall false credibility. That's a lot of what they use the residential proxies for. Uh, they're trying to look like a like you know a standard user or somebody who should be visiting a site or doing something or sending traffic, basically. And then we have uh, standard proxy jacking. So proxy jacking itself is not necessarily new. Um, people have been compromising servers and then turning them into sort of their private proxy that they can use for a long time. Uh, what I'm talking about today, I'll differentiate in the next slide, but is essentially easily scalably monetizing these uh, proxies that th they jack. Um, so basically what a proxy jacking campaign in general is, is a device gets compromised and then it's converted into an involuntary proxy uh, without typically the user knowing and then it can be used for many of those purposes that we talked about in the malicious uses slide. Um, and the result of this is there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of proxies that you see on the internet that are disclosed as open proxies that are not, necessential, not, essential, not necessarily uh, knowing that they are an open proxy. Um, you also have high quality proxies that uh, things like botnets tried to search out for and so then um, they can use sort of proxies that nobody else has and they can use them um, so they don't get like, burnt out as fast and people know about them. Um, so then private use obviously has a higher value in that sense than just open proxies. And uh, this, this screenshot is of, uh, we, we're using Maltigo and we found uh, one of the proxies that we're talking about in this um, talk. It was actually uh, found on a bunch of different forums. So it was like a known open uh, proxy, basically. OK, so now uh, pivoting into proxy jacking for profit. This is, uh, it gets a little bit more complicated because there's a bunch more parties involved. But essentially, it starts the same. Uh, an attacker compromises a victim. And then the victim is used as a proxy, just like before. But then this bandwidth is then sold and monetized. Um, and it's essentially enabled through affiliate payouts of some sort of company that will buy them. Um, and then this company, it's typically done with two separate companies. So one company to buy the bandwidth from the user, and then another one that's owned by the same people, but they claim to be separate companies, that will then go and turn these, um, this bandwidth that's like verified through their sister company, they'll then focus on selling it. And then you can also see some people do both sides of that. You have uh, in that bottom screenshot, you can see somebody's uh, buying it for 10 cents a gig and then selling it for a dollar a gig, which is pretty good turnaround, honestly. Um, uh, but both companies get to say that they sourced it ethically because they're working with a trusted partner, which is just basically themselves. Um, and so that's, that's something interesting. Um, and then essentially, 
client traffic from the sister company gets proxied through the victim, and then the person who compromised the proxy originally gets that money. Um, so basically, the attacker and both companies um, and the buyer who uses this proxied um, bandwidth gets to profit off this while the victim is just unsuspecting. Um, and just a cool little tidbit is that if you Google what is proxy jacking, our article is the first thing that comes up, which is kind of fun. Um, okay, so now we're gonna talk about the bandwidth sharing companies that uh, sort of enable this. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to call out any individual company here, so you're gonna see a lot of different ones because there are a lot of different ones and uh, varying levels of legitimacy. Uh, but basically, what they do is they offer to monetize your unused bandwidth, and they make it really easy to set it up. Some of them want to be only on like Windows, um, or like, like actual end user computers, and so they'll make it so that only those people can install it on their systems, but a lot of them just have Docker containers, and you can run Docker on so many different things. So, um, yeah, basically, uh, it, it varies on who it is, on where it can be installed. But it's a very minimal setup. Uh, you'll see the script that we talk about later actually literally just followed all the steps that they had on the website um, to install it on the victim's uh, uh, endpoint. And then um, you just use your email as the source of payout. So it, it just links with your account that way typically. And then they'll know who's the traffic coming in through. And uh, they'll pay you for that. And uh, there's tons of in incentives to expand out to your network. So typically it's pitched as, oh, tell your family and friends, get them involved, and you'll make money while they make money. And then um, everybody profits that way, basically. And what this essentially gives us is scalable passive income. And um, for me, that's not something I'm particularly interested in because I'm not trying to share my bandwidth. But for a lot of other people who don't care as much about that, that's a legitimate business. Um, so it, it's on its face is not malicious, but you can see how it gets um, abused through the unchecked affiliate payout, basically. And a lot of times it's paid in cash, and then some of the more um, less reputable ones do it through crypto, um, which they store themselves, and then you can pull it out at a certain time, but it sets it up for all sorts of different weirdness. Um, it, in these screenshots on the top one, you can just see one of the many different um, uh, Docker containers on a Docker repo that you can pull down the image. And uh, then beneath that, you can see it's kind of funny. Peer to Profit was at one point telling you to uh, download it onto your corporate laptop and your friend's corporate laptop. So I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, so this is just a few of the different companies that at the time, I think it was last summer, I pulled together. So I'm sure there's more now. Some of these are no longer existent as well. Uh, but essentially, there's a lot of different people in this um, area. And along with this, there's also uh, sort of an underground culture of people who try to exploit this uh, industry outside of what we're talking about today. Uh, so some of these people, well, well, first of all, all these terms of services say uh, don't install it anywhere you're not supposed to. Uh, don't try to do anything that we wouldn't want you to do. But um, there's a whole bunch of different non-official containers out there that you can download. And a lot of those have exploits of the original service that allows you to sort of uh, get more money than you should or spoof your machine as like something that would be more valuable to them than it really is. Uh, then they also have ones that install like eight of these on your laptop because I, th I think I saw somewhere it's like 90% of your bandwidth goes unused so you really have a lot to share and um, you can double dip through all of these guys at the same time uh, which is questionable whether that's against some of their terms of service. Um, so yeah. Okay, and then one of the last things we're going to talk about before we actually dive into the malicious code and the campaign is uh, just basically the value of the diversified bandwidth to uh, actual companies. So um, these companies that are sort of buying bandwidth from end users, they're selling it to companies for the purpose of things like data collection, uh, search engine optimization, uh, checking whether your advertisements are effective in various um, sectors or different locations. Uh, they're also checking market prices all over the place and sort of uh, bringing that together. And then um, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of research that's possible with this, and it's actually very valuable. Um, and it's, it's helpful to have a vast geographic distribution, especially when it comes to residential um, computers, which is a lot of what some of these companies are looking for. 
Some of the similarities to crypto jacking here, uh, I think should be pretty obvious. You know, you're stealing um, some of the resources that come on the end, uh, the end user's device and you're sort of monetizing that um, without them knowing. Um, we've seen a lot of similarities in both how they're installing this on the various user's devices as well as um, just like how they're going about like anti-compete, which we'll go into later. Um, but basically, they're, they're very similar ideas, which is why you see a lot of things mirrored between the two. Uh, basically, the main difference is that crypto jacking uses a lot of CPU, whereas proxy jacking uses high bandwidth. Um, and so the typical things that you would look for to identify a crypto jacking scheme, you wouldn't necessarily find a proxy jacking scheme. Uh, so that, that makes it a little bit of a different thing and a little bit sneakier, honestly. Um, but yeah, overall they have very similar threat profiles and victim landscapes, and we'll show you exactly um, uh, some examples of that a little bit later. Okay, getting into the real world cases. Um, so this was a screenshot I took on the Hacker News um, after Sysdig, which was the other company that essentially is publishing some research on this. It's only us two right now. Um, they found um, one that was using proxy jacking and crypto jacking within the same malware. Uh, they also found one that was LogForge uh, using that exploit. And, um, and then in this one you see they were deploying LabRat on GitLab. Uh, but the one we found was in SSH servers like we talked about before, uh, just really weak passwords. Um, I'm sure they were looking for other things, but that's how they got in uh, originally with us. And um, so yeah, it's just us two right now. It was on the front page of Hacker News for a while, so it, it, it kind of blew up. It's pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, so, so far it's just the two of us. Okay, getting into a closer look at the SSH campaign, uh, which is the one that we discovered. So um, I have originally found this by sorting through the honeypot data that we found, uh, that we have. So obviously we have them hundreds, uh, if not thousands, distributed all around the world. That pulls down a lot of malware. So the goal is to get as many different uh, malicious payloads as we can. And so in order to filter through that, I do a lot of Yara filtering. So things that I see like every day, like every sort of variant of Mirai, I'm not necessarily interested in, and so I create YAR rules to filter those out. Um, and this one was pretty interesting. I found uh, a file called csdark.css, and uh, that one stood out because it was not malicious. It was literally just curl disguised as something else. Uh, so like when I pulled it up on virus total, which you'll see in the next slide, um, it was just literally okay because it was curl. I, curl is fine. <laughs> Um, but I pivoted on the hash anyways, and you see in this, uh, the top screenshot here, this is a custom Altigo transform that I made that pulls from all the different parts of our various uh, honeypot networks. And so basically by just taking that curl hash and uh, yeah, the, the file name basically just pulled down all of the, the files and scripts uh, and like IPs and URLs that were within this scheme, and it really gave me like a big picture. I even found the guy's email. That's pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, this was, um, oh, we were able to find the distribution IP from this and a couple other hashes, even though it was fileless, it was like the hash for the scripts. Uh, the only file that they used was that curl one. And uh, there was double base 64 encoding, which is nothing special. It's just a little bit of a evasion technique to get around some detection. Uh, but yeah, so then from there we were able to get to the distribution server and it was still up. So we pulled down everything immediately um, and sort of took some deeper looks. Uh, this is where I wasn't sure if there was one campaign that was uh, distributing both proxy jacking and crypto jacking schemes at the same time or if it was just like a common server that's known to be like a good distribution one um, that's getting exploited in the same vulnerabilities. But essentially it was a really outdated server and um, it did store that curl executable, but it also had perfcc, which is Linux specific uh, crypto mining binary. So um, I'm assuming that one was also getting distributed at some point from this spot. Um, and this compromised server, I actually looked up and it was for a like high end, like interior remodeling site in Libya. So, um, so yeah, th I'm sure they're not working in cahoots with these guys, uh, but as you can see, this uh, csdark.css, which is actually curl, came up all, all green on virus total, whereas the um, perfcc did not. So um, what the script does is uh, initially 
does a really low down and dirty version of curl to pull down the actual version of curl. And then from there, it pulls down the Docker image. Uh, the fact that there's Docker images makes it really easy on them, uh, honestly, to set up. So they just pull it from the Docker repo, um, and then they set their email as the beneficiary, and they just really follow the instructions on the repo. Um, and there you go, you have uh, peer, for pro peer to profit installed on the victim's device with um, the attacker as the beneficiary. Um, so yeah. And then what we see is a whole bunch of different anti-compete tactics. So basically they do a lot of the same things as crypto jacking, uh, where they search out uh, the different executable locations, they check for their own instances running and see whether they need to be upgraded, and then they check for other containers of other people doing this uh, exact same campaign, and they basically kill those and take them offline, and then they replace them with theirs. Um, and then at the end, they clean up what they're doing, actually, and they delete a lot of the artifacts, but that didn't matter for us because we were capturing the logs as they happened. Um, and so, yeah, m most of this is like exactly what you would see from a crypto miner as well. So, um, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the potential. Uh, a question? No, they didn't do that. Not in this one. But I'm assuming uh, if this continues in the future, we'll see every sort of variance that crypto jacking has done as well. So, yeah. Yeah, not in this case, though. Um, I have a question. Sorry. I, I missed that pa part. How did you figure out that the CS dart dot CSS was it Honeypot or I, I don't know what I did you how did you I guess how did you start looking at that my question right so um, the hash it would that was actually curl so right. the fact that it was a legitimate a legitimate executable actually made it stand out against all of the crap that we get in the honeypots and so because oh. that's not something typical that happens in a honeypot, at least the ones that I see. Okay. I isolated it, brought it into Maltigo. So because everything. it looks so good, it looks so, that brought your interest, right? That it was just out of the norm for the honeypot. Oh, it's not? Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. But yeah. that dot CSS is really too low other Docker thing, right? The curl thing. It wasn't, it just... It, it was just, it was standard curl, just used to pull down a Docker image. Right. Yeah, okay. there was nothing malicious about it, which is what it was kind of weird to me. Okay, all right, yeah. thanks. Yeah. All right, so now we have a bunch of different potential uh, things for the future for uh, this sort of campaign. Uh, definitely tons of nefarious implications. My, the first thing that came to my mind, and actually other people have brought this up in um, past presentations that I've given, is uh, could you use virtual private servers to install these um, sort of bandwidth sharing schemes and then potentially make more money on those than it costs and then uh, basically make infinite money. Um, and to answer some of them, you could do that. Um, you're going to have to experiment on your own, but I'll show you in another slide which ones are okay with it and which ones are not okay with that. Um, but then you also have endless referrals. So you have you can not only set it up as one device on your network, but if they stop allowing you to have um, like if you're only limited to like five devices on your, um, that you can supply, then your referral network could grow infinite maybe. Uh, so you can expand that way. Uh, you can also uh, spoof what kind of device like we were talking about. Uh, there's also rug pulls because they're promising you crypto and you have like an online sort of uh, a running total of the crypto that you earned. That it's nothing saying that they have to give that to you and they can just dip and run. And then there's also things like um, what can they expand into, such as like IoT devices. You know, we see them uh, doing it on a bunch of different types of servers already. And then also mobile is something that I haven't really seen tapped into yet. There's Android-focused uh, ones, but I haven't seen anything for like Apple, something like that. Um, and then you can do it on a bunch of different alternate accounts, so you can sort of uh, create some resilience. Um, well, the attacker can create some sort of resilience, so if one gets shut down, they can just pivot onto the next one. They already have everything installed, so it's perfect. Uh, and in case you're wondering, this is just one uh, sort of, one of these schemes, um, sorry, one of the, this is peer to profit. This is what they pay, or used to pay, um, a while back for various things. So on your network, you can see they pay um, like, three cents a gig for business, whereas for residential, it's um, oh, it's 80 cents. Sorry, misread that. And then for your referrals, it's half as much, but it's still pretty good. Um, 
And so then um, a divergence, right? I feel like we actually, us and Sysdig, because of how fa far it's spread on uh, um, the Hacker News and other sites like that, the Bleeping Computer, a bunch of different ones like that, I feel like we actually made a difference. I've seen a lot of them change how they're um, operating, these, these bandwidth sharing companies. Uh, and basically, they've either completely went legitim they legitimized themselves where they got like uh, really official and like full transparency. And then there's some that went completely offline and went underground. And I'll give you an example of both. Uh, but you can see how some of them are differentiating themselves. Some of them are just like, we want, we want Windows devices and you can only have 10 devices um, and one IP. And then you have other ones that are like, we'll take literally anything you have to give us. Uh, we'll fund them differently, but we'll, we just want devices. We want proxies, right? Any, any means to get them. Um, and so basically, you're at that point supporting the intended customers. Are you trying to get legitimate res residential proxies or are you trying to make this something scalable that would favor people that are trying to create things like botnets? So company A, we're, we're gonna do two examples here. Company A, uh, one of the people that legitimized themselves, I tried to keep the name out of it so nobody gets hurt. Um, but this one chose to sh uh, shape up and basically they whitelisted uh, the allowed devices. It's a very short list, so you need to be one of these devices in order for us to work with you, essentially. And then um, they focused on personal laptops, like we talked before, and if anybody does any of these strikes that they have listed on their website, terms of service, then you get a ban, like really quickly. And they also do cash payouts, which doesn't, you know, you wouldn't think that would be a sign of legitimacy, but in this uh, particular case, it is a little bit more legitimate. And uh, they had a complete rebrand in the last year. Um, they are completely transparent with where you're getting your, um, what, what sort of traffic's getting proxied through you, who was the buyer, things like that. And then um, it'll also tell you ahead of time what potential gains you could get. So if you're trying to register a device and be like, what would I get for this? Um, they'll, they'll tell you ahead of time. Uh, they're also, you see in the wording, they're talking about security focused and um, it really pays in this scheme to have a quality proxy as opposed to just a bunch of them. Um, so yeah, the focus here was bandwidth value. And then you have company B. Uh, this one also had a website when we first published, but then they took it down. Um, and then they went completely underground to just operating on Telegram, which is not a great sign. Uh, they have unlimited device types, unlimited device count, uh, focus on Android and Docker. Um, and then they have complete lack of transparency, basically don't ask. Um, and it pays about eight times higher. Uh, you can, I don't know if you can read this disclaimer, but it's actually pretty funny. Um, this program is for learning purposes only, not for profit. Please delete it within 24 hours after downloading. Uh, yeah, whatever. Um, and they also pay out in crypto, uh, which is like we talked about, just slightly sketchy. But since this is actually an underground uh, members only committee now, uh, they might have a little bit more trust involved with that. Uh, but basically, the scheme here is get bandwidth at any means, uh, by any means. And so that's basically what they're supporting. Okay, so now let's start talking about the impact on defenders. Um, obviously, this was a semi-obfuscated file script. You know, it was encoded multiple times. Um, the only download that it actually had was cleared, sorry, the only file that was uh, downloaded was actually cleared by VirusTotal completely. Um, and any sort of CPU monitoring that we use for crypto jacking is kind of useless here because that's not going to be a big tell of these kind of campaigns. Um, and then additionally, labeling these softwares as potentially unwanted applications or programs uh, will increase false positive positives and it won't really affect the average user. It'll help a little bit within companies as long as they pair it with some like TTPs, but essentially, um, essentially that won't really help most people. Uh, so we do have some defensive measures though. So obviously monitoring your network traffic, seeing if it's going where you think it's going, uh, looking for anomalies, uh, and then staying aware of unwanted processes running. Uh, these are really good steps. Obviously the average user cannot uh, necessarily manage this themselves. Um, we also should patch applications. We saw some of the ones discovered by Sysdig were doing uh, application vulnerabilities that they were exploiting and getting their um, payloads onto the system that way. 
uh, the one with us was just really weak passwords. Uh, and because we're a honeypot, we said any password you give us, that's the right answer, come on in. Um, but in that case, multi-factor authentication is obviously a win there uh, and strong passwords. Uh, but then, like I said before, the TTP-based TTP endpoint detection, you know, if you have a encoded file or script running and then it downloads content, that's obviously um, a cause for concern. So things like that are a much better strategy than just trying to block the hash of every single uh, Docker image on the repo. Uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, exactly, that's one way, yeah. Okay, and then I just wanted to also talk about the evolution that I've seen since uh, the initial discovery uh, this last summer, and then some other predictions for the future. Um, so one of my initial predictions was obviously, it's very similar to crypto jacking, I wonder if we're going to start seeing both of these used in tandem so you can exploit the full resources available to you. And that has been seen since uh, with LabRat, which was later more towards um, like October, I believe. Um, and then obviously I think more vulnerabilities are going to be exploited. And then uh, I think this is going to be, this was incorporated into full malware like we saw with LabRat as well. But I think it's going to be incorporated into a lot more. Uh, the example I use here typically is uh, crypto jacking has begun to be implemented in all different kinds of malware as just sort of a side thing. Like even if uh, part of it's not successful, at least you're crypto mining. Um, and so uh, one example of that is this malware called KMSD bot, which was written in Go and discovered by my colleague, Larry Cashdollar. And yes, that's his real name. Um, and we presented that in France uh, for BotConf. It was this um, basically, it was geared for DDoS for hire, but it was also doing crypto um, jacking in the background. So um, I predict in those sort of use cases, they'll also be using uh, proxy jacking techniques alongside that. Uh, I also predict that they're going to move into IoT devices. Uh, you know, anything that can have traffic routed through it or run Docker, I think will be prime targets. Uh, I also, like I said before, I think we'll move into mobile devices a lot more. Um, I also think there's going to be a lot of different kinds of resource jacking that we've yet to see. Uh, obviously, this is just another example, but like I said at the beginning of the talk, this is sort of a class of uh, attacks that I'm seeing that I think is going to become a new trend of what can we monetize on the victim user without necessarily causing them direct harm, but nonetheless like exploiting their resources. Um, and I also think there's going to be more sketchier bandwidth sharing companies uh, who will turn a blind eye to the sourcing. Uh, right now, there's only a handful of them that are legitimately sketchy, but I think there's going to be a couple others that sort of adopt that same idea. I, I liken it to sort of the initial, um, when people started s spreading spam as a way to advertise, and you had all these botnets that were being created to distribute all these uh, like emails to people, uh, get around filtering and things like that. Uh, I predict that there's going to be incentives like that um, moving forward. All right, so that's basically um, the talk, the you know, the finer points. So, if, does anybody have questions now, or if you don't, you can email uh, cert at akamai.com if you have questions later. You mentioned a legitimate use for proxy jacking. Is no, just proxies. Oh, just for proxies. And then the companies that uh, provide bandwidth sharing, uh, that's like a legitimate, a lot of them are, you know, normal companies that want to monetize that, but no legitimate uses for crypto, uh, proxy jacking. Yeah, I don't really understand, um, well, I, don't, I just don't. Uh, why, why would you say the traditional CPU monitoring is not useful here? I mean... I, I just don't understand this kind of stuff, so I'm trying to sure. figure it out. Yeah, so with crypto jacking, or crypto mining, right, you're yeah. using a lot of CPUs because you're trying to contribute uh, computing power into solving like a problem which gets you yeah. that sort of stuff. But with proxy jacking, that has nothing to do with it. It's literally just routing through traffic. Uh, oh. So it would take a lot more for that to have a CPU impact. Oh, it's the routing. Oh, I see. Okay, all right, thanks.
All right. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you.